Well, good evening. Uh, welcome to the Science Cafe. Uh, this is, uh, as somebody has pointed out to me, is that the Science Cafe, for those who've been here before, maybe some of you have been here the whole time, we started September 16th, 2008, so this puts us into our 10th year of doing Science Cafes. So that's a long time there. Uh, I'm Paul Adams. I'm a director of the Science Math Education Institute that has been sponsoring these along with Kansas Citizens for Science and other groups that we've had over the years and donors. And uh, we uh, are turning in the fall a little bit more towards the mind and mindfulness and uh, we'll talk more about what we're doing. And then in the spring, we're going to be shifting over to, uh, we'll start with nuclear fusion to just get us into a deep, deep science there a little bit with it. But uh, because, you know, I, you know, I was walk, looking at my email last night and I saw I got this AMC uh Ticket stubs, and you know, you could have bought your tickets to the next Star Wars movies last starting last night. So, those of you that are buffs, you know, it's time. And so, we thought because it's going to be a big event, but that uh, we thought we'd do something with it. So, Brad, uh, Will, and I were talking one time, and he was explaining to me how Yoda was all wrong and or something. I will stop there. <laughs> and I said, Really, we need to bring this to a public scrutiny. So, we're going to hear his thesis so that it may be on there. But let me introduce tonight, we do have Brad Will, who's an associate professor of English, assistant dean of arts and humanities at Fort Hayes, and it is, what we'll, what would you do? Let's welcome him with an applause. And applause. Thanks. So, um, so I realize as I'm standing here that, that logistically I did not plan this well at all because I was going to look at the slides over here. Oh, man. And the mic is cutting out. That's terrible. Hang on. So because of my bifocals, I can barely read my computer screen from here. So I will be occasionally bending over and staring at it intently. Sorry. Um, so yeah, uh, as Paul was saying, this is, this is one of the more science-free science cafes. Uh, so the, the science here tonight will be completely imaginary, which makes it not science at all. Um, so, uh, doing Star Wars, this is my security detail, Clone Commander Wolf. Thank you, Commander, for coming in his subordinate troop. Good job. Thank you, Trooper. Um, I, I, I guess I'm, I want to begin by saying that when you're talking sort of academically about Star Wars, uh, for for a very brief time, it it felt like we were in a sweet zone, where Lucas had done those six movies, and then he promised that he would never make another movie again, right? And so, uh, it was it was an okay time to talk about Star Wars because at least as far as the movies were concerned, the world was finished and we were done. Now uh, now that we've got movies coming out every year. Uh, nothing is finished, and Star Wars has become a moving target. So it's hard to speak with any sensibility about Star Wars. So uh, with that said, what I'm saying tonight, I, I suspect might have some relevance to things that are coming out uh, when we see The Last Jedi at Christmas. But it's entirely possible, given the events that were in the trailer that dropped last night, uh, that that everything I'm saying is complete nonsense. So, so here's here's the thing. The real point of all this, and I'll get to this when we get to the end of it. But just as a prelude, so you know where we're going, is I'm suggesting maybe an alternative way to view the uh, three prequel movies, episodes one, two, and three, which are are much hated and loathed by many people. And I I was a person who. When, when they came out, I just was not really into them. Uh, they were not on my radar. I didn't see the second movie just because I just didn't know I didn't see it. It just, that's how much I didn't care about it. But, but after, after the third movie came out, I got some professional connections to Star Wars and I started doing some Star Wars work and uh, Star Wars suddenly mattered to me a lot. And so then I came back and watched those movies and it, it turns out I don't think they suck. Uh, I think they're actually pretty good. Uh, they have some problems, and you know, if somebody wants to ask a question about that later, that's great. But anyway, so my point, my point in all this is um, maybe there's something going on in those movies, though, that we don't get. That is, that is, when we watch those movies and they seem strange and they seem to not make sense in some ways, 
uh, maybe what I'm telling you tonight will make some sense. And so if you're like me, and every time there's a new Star Wars movie that comes out, you make your family watch all of the Star Wars movies leading up to that so that you'll be in the right frame of mind. Yeah, pity to my wife and son there. Um, then, you know, when you watch the prequels again at Christmas time, uh, maybe you'll enjoy them differently, maybe better even, who knows, after this. So anyway, um, what would Yoda do? Uh, this came out of, uh, actually, I began to conceive of the stuff I'm talking about tonight as part of a class that I taught with uh, Steven Schleicher, who's standing over there, and Scott Robeson. Uh, we taught a Star Wars class for the university. It was about three or so years ago, three or four, maybe. I can't even remember. Uh, and one of, the, one of the talks I gave in that class was to my students, and I was trying to give them a, a way of understanding how different cultures grasp different, the same text. Uh, and Star Wars is a really cool way of doing that because uh, those of us, which uh, probably everybody in this room who grew up in the Western world, that is the European Judeo-Christian tradition that, that we know, we have a very different take on concepts of like the force than would a person who grew up in a Taoist tradition uh, where uh, some stuff about the force makes no sense at all. And so I was trying to give my students a, a look at that. And I'm, I'll start by just sort of talk, talking you through that business. Um, so we all know this. This is obvious stuff. From the Judeo-Christian tradition, we have the dualism of good and evil, right? Dual, uh, good and evil is, is basic business. So when we look at the force and we hear that there's the light side of the force and the dark side of the force, we make the immediate and obvious connection. The light side is good. The dark side is evil. And it feels so natural to us. It comes as, as something that we don't think twice about. It's just part of what, what is in our makeup. So often we don't understand that that actually has a historical place to it. And actually notions of light and darkness being alongside good and evil is a third century AD idea. It is an idea called Manichaeism, and it comes from this Babylonian guy named Mani who created a religion. Uh, and basically it was all about how the light kingdom of God uh, was battling uh, Satan's kingdom of darkness. And so that's where all of that business starts from, right? But it's a third century idea. That is, uh, it's less than 2,000 years old, which is pretty fresh as ideas go, or at least as some ideas go. Uh, so somebody who's coming from an Eastern tradition has the Taoist vision, where the dualism there is the dualism of yin-yang. And... Uh, I, some people have a really good sense of this, but a lot of times folks have very little sense of that. So I'm going to kind of run through yin-yang stuff for you guys. Um, the Taoist would make this immediate and obvious connection that the light side is equated with yang, the light side of yin-yang, and the dark side would be equated with yin, the dark side of yin-yang. Uh, and then after about 10 seconds of thinking about that, the Taoist would be uh, horribly confused because then everything kind of goes sideways. And here's why. In Taoism, uh, yin has the, well, it has a lot of very specific parameters to it. It is a lot of very specific characteristics. One is activity. So yin, yang is activity. Yin, I'll, I'll get my gestures wrong because I'm thinking of this backwards. Yang is activity. Yin is passivity, right? And so um, another aspect, uh, yang is presence, yin is absence. Now this is kind of a complicated idea. Uh, that is, I mean, presence and absence is, is a pretty specific idea, but uh, it's a cool way to illustrate how one item can have aspects of both yin and yang. I, uh, oh, I'm losing, my mic is dying. Come back, Mike, come back, Mike. Oh, oh, there, nope. Give me 10 seconds, okay. All right, the mic was yin for a minute there. Did you catch that? <laughs> so this glass, right, this, this glass is, is present in a sense, right? It's also very hard, it's shiny, and it has these sharp ridges on it, right? Uh, it is yang. If, if I were to whack someone on the head with this, if I were to whack someone on the head with this glass, they would know exactly how yang it is. It is very yang. But the inside of the glass, right, the part that you pour the beer in, that is yin, right? because that's an absence, that's a whole. So in that sense, the glass is yin, but it's also yang. So keep both of those things in mind, right? Um, my one son, Ian, is here. My other son, Ryan, 
is absent, right? So in, in, from my point of view right now, Ryan is yin, but he is also at rehearsal for the Hayesheim musical. So the people there, for them, he is super yang because he's probably like singing and being really loud and obnoxious as he occasionally is. So, so you know, at the same time, right, from my point of view, yin, from their point of view, yang. Other yin-yang stuff. Yang is about passion. Um, yin is about serenity. Yang has heat. Yin is cool. So it's all these kind of these sort of dualisms, right? Uh, yang is speed, where yin is slowness. Uh, yang is positivity. Yin is negativity. Um, yang, weirdly, this one I don't get, but I accept as being true. Uh, yang is even numbers. Yin is odd numbers. Now, like in my head, that seems exactly the opposite. It should be the other way around. Um, but uh, that's what I read. So that's what we're going with. So we also have, um, well, okay, let's do this. My little quiz. Um, the Death Star. Just everybody shout out. Is the Death Star yin or is it yang? Yeah. Is Yang, yes, thank you. I should be, I, by the way, thank you, Doug. I should be saying Yang, but I lived in Oklahoma for seven years, so I say Yang. So <laughs> go figure. All right, it is Yang, in fact. Yeah, I'll switch up that pronunciation just to confuse you all. Good job. The Death Star exhaust port. Is that Yin or Yang? Yeah. It is Yin. Well, it's both, okay, but Yin. We're going to say Yin because that helps my, my little quiz here. Firing torpedoes at the Death Star exhaust port, is that yin or yang? That is yang. It's very aggressive. It's an aggressive thing to do, right? Switching off your targeting computer, is that yin or yang? That is yin. Thank you. Someone said yin. Thank you. Yes, it is, in fact, yin. Hatred, anger, and fear, is that yin or yang? That is very young. Meditating, being cool and chilling out. Yin or yang? Yeah. Yin, of course. You guys are getting this. You see how this is going, right? Vader, the Sith, and the dark side. Yang. And Yoda, the Jedi, and the light side. Yin. But, well, what the heck? Because... The Sith and all the bad guy stuff is over there on the light side with Yang, right? Uh, so I don't know. George Lucas totally screwed that up, right? Um, <laughs> like that's really embarrassing. Like, and, and this was some of my some of my students says like a, if like a Taoist were like a, like a Taoist who just was not not aware of Western culture but watches Star Wars, right? Would watch this and just be like, what? What is wrong with these guys? Like how how totally messed up and wrong could they possibly be, right? Now. Yeah, that, that's, you know, that has to do with the fact that Lucas is Manichae and he's not Taoist, right? Uh, but there's this other thing that Lucas did with episode one, uh, the prophecy of the chosen one, right? And, and you guys know this story that uh, dear sweet Anakin um, is the chosen one. He is said to be the one who will bring balance to the force. And this is the reason that Qui-Gon Jinn, uh, sorry for anybody who's not seen Star Wars, uh, good luck. Just God bless you and good luck getting through this evening. <laughs> Just gonna cry. Um, so, so that's the reason why Qui-Gon wants to bring Anakin into the Jedi Order, even though Anakin is way too old at like seven or whatever he is. Uh, he's way too old to be a Jedi, but okay, right? So for, for Western culture, from our perspective, <laughs> When we think of balance, right, what would be the balance that Anakin could bring to the Force? It can only mean that good conquers evil. That's, that's the only thing that sort of makes sense there. Although, and this is, this is part of the problem with the resonance of those first three movies, it's hard to think about the word balance when we think of the light side and the dark side. Like a balanced version of the light side and the dark side, balance is not it, right? Because because the light side should be victorious and it should obliterate the dark side and justice and goodness should prevail um, in the world, right? That's what we would imagine. If somebody uh, from an Eastern culture, a Taoist, were to see this, they would imagine yin and, yin and yang existing together as they do in the, the 
famous circle drawing that we see, right? Uh, yin and yang aren't fighting with each other. They just are harmoniously together. And a healthy person has a good mix of yin and yang in their life because we want to have that kind of balance. So the idea of the light side vanquishing the dark side is not there at all, right? Except that's totally what we're geared for. And I pretty much talked about going already. Um, so yeah, so in, in this case, for balance, when somebody says Anakin is going to bring balance to the force, we imagine that this is going to play out in a very specific way, right? That and, and we already know because episode one comes out way after episode three. We already know how it all ends. And spoiler, Anakin destroys the Sith, right? Uh, sorry, again, if I blew that for anybody, God bless, but okay. Um, so, so in our vision, balance can only come about because Anakin destroys the Sith. He sets the world right. He gets rid of the dark side and everything is light side and everything is hunky dory and awesome. And so that's what happens at the end of episode six and everything is cool and everything makes sense. For the Taoist, um, if they look at this and they say, okay, the Jedi are going to achieve balance, that Anakin is gonna help the Jedi achieve balance, the Taoist is gonna say, those Jedi, wow, Anakin's gonna come in and he's gonna cure them of this crazy obsession they have with Yin because, because the Jedi are all about Yin, right? The Jedi are all about being mellow, being cool, not being passionate. In fact, passion, that's the way of the Sith, right? Uh, you don't you don't have anger if you're a Jedi because, how's it go? Somebody knows this better than I do. Anger leads to fear, fear leads to hatred, something, something, awesome, death, right? Thank you. Yeah, okay, I can do better than that, but not tonight. So the prophecy doesn't make sense, right? The prophecy makes no sense uh, from a Taoist point of view, but also like why balance? Why of all things balance? Obi-Wan asks this. Well, I guess he makes this statement. Uh, this is this is on Mustafar uh, after he has cut down Anakin. Uh, again, spoilers. Uh, Anakin's laying there with very few limbs, mostly no limbs at all, uh, next to a roaring pool of lava, river of lava, uh, and surely to die, except that he gets rescued in a minute. Uh, but but um, Obi-Wan says, you were the chosen one. It was said, I can't, I'm not going to do the emotional voice, sorry. It was said that you would destroy the Sith, not join them, bring balance to the force, not leave it in darkness. So Obi-Wan, of course, is existing in episode three. Uh, he's not achieved wherever he's going to be at the end of episode six as a great force spirit and all that kind of business. Um, so Obi-Wan doesn't know what Anakin's final result is going to be. So he, you know, he has this big rant, you know, why would you destroy the Sith? You were the one who was supposed to bring balance. But that's actually a pretty legit question. That is, um, so if George Lucas is writing this story where, okay, there's this prophecy that this dude here is going to bring balance to the lightness and the darkness, the light being good and the darkness being evil, why would destroying the light be like step one in that process? That doesn't make any sense. Like, like the prophecy should be, this is the guy who's going to be your worst nightmare ever. Oh, and by the way, redemption at the end or something like that, right? But, but um, I mean, it's like, well, I don't know. I was going to, I was going to make a, 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 a grotesque analogy there. It's, a, it's like somebody promising to bring something nice to your dinner party, but they bring something horrible along with the nice thing, right? And you just forget about the nice thing and it's just all horrible. Uh, like, what is, what is Lucas thinking? And this is a question a lot of people ask, and I, maybe I have an answer for you. But it's not on this slide. <laughs> so this business of balance, though, I'm suggesting is that's the part of episodes one, two, and three that make us feel like those movies don't make sense. So there's a lot of things. There are a lot of Jar Jar Binks. I mean, we can go through the list. I don't need the list of, of all the things in those movies that make us frustrated with them. But I think this is a key one. This is a key plot point that just feels off. So that when we look at the Jedi, and we love the Jedi because the Jedi are awesome, uh, but balance and nothing makes sense, and why would you do that? Oh, my God. Um, and I guess some people would say, and maybe I'm suggesting that he did mix some out of place Taoism into the Manichaeism. That is, he accidentally dropped some Taoism into this 
because he wanted to be cool with Eastern philosophy or something, maybe. Unless. It's my 10-second slide. Unless the Force really is Taoist, and the Jedi actually do have an unhealthy obsession with yin. Like, that's actually a thing, right? Uh, by the way, I didn't totally make this up myself, but there are a lot of people who understand this, but or at least understand this could be a thing. So the Jedi have this obsession with yin, and so they make this rule that members of the Jedi Order are not allowed to have attachment to others. They're not allowed to have deep abiding relationships with others. It's part of the Jedi thing, right? So if you if you like someone too much, there's actually a, a bit in one of the movies, I should grab the quote, but I grabbed a lot of quotes for this, um, where Yoda is giving Anakin a lecture about how jealousy, basically attachment leads to jealousy, jealousy leads to anger, yet, 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 and down the line, right? So if you get attached to anybody, if you love anybody, uh, don't, because it's just going to be a nightmare for you. That comes as, I'm speaking of nightmares for you, that comes as Anakin is trying to tell Yoda about the nightmares and the visions he's having about Padme dying. And he doesn't tell her, tell Yoda it's Padme because Anakin and Padme have the secret marriage and all that business. Uh, and if anybody in the Jedi Order finds out, Anakin will be driven out of the Order and his life will be crushed and his life will be destroyed. So he's afraid to tell Yoda by the way, I married this woman, and now I'm having these crazy visions that she's going to die in childbirth. But he's trying to have Yoda help him with this without telling Yoda anything that's going on, for those of you who haven't seen the movie. So one of the things I'm suggesting is that the, my premise, that is, that the Force is Taoist, that the Force is Taoist and the, the Jedi's are weirdly Manichaean and inappropriately Manichaean as they deal with this Taoist force actually comes out in the movie. And so this is where I got my title, What Would Yoda Do? Uh, in the second movie, Attack of the Clones, the movie that I skipped and didn't even know I skipped it, but it turns out it's, it's not that great, but it's not that bad either. I mean, they're certainly worse movies, right? Uh, at the end of it, uh, there's a gigantic battle on the planet of Geonosis, um, and all the Jedi pile in, and they're going to rescue uh, Obi-Wan and Anakin and Padme, who have been captured. And so the Jedi come in, and they're kicking ass and waving around lightsabers. And it's a really cool scene because there are like 50 or 70 lightsabers all waggling around on the screen at once. They're very tiny because it's a long shot, but it's really cool. And then they get ambushed by all the droids that the Separatists have. And so the Jedi are getting decimated by all the droids. And then at the last second, uh, Yoda comes in with our clone army and the clones come in and they take names and they kick butt and they clean the place up, right? And so there's this, but a lot of Jedi die in that fight, right? Uh, and so in that fight uh, is Count Dooku and Count Dooku uh, makes his way to a little Separatist headquarters eventually and then he flees Separatist headquarters. But at one point in the fight, Yoda says to uh, Mace Windu, if Dooku escapes, rally more people to his cause, he will. That is, uh, and then he goes on a little bit, but the gist of this is if Count Dooku gets away, then this is going to turn into a giant full-fledged war as opposed to this little weird military action that we've got going on here. So Yoda makes it clear, we have to capture Count Dooku, right? This is, this is our mission right now. We must capture him. So our friends, Padme, Anakin, and Obi-Wan are in this transport ship that has uh, no walls, so the clone troopers can hop out really easily, but it's not the best bet for riding around the planet Geonosis. And they catch sight of Count Dooku, who's on like this flying motorcycle thing that has a weird piece in front that would totally block anybody's vision. I don't know how the guy doesn't run into rocks all the time, but he doesn't, so it's okay. So Count Dooku is riding his, his air motorcycle, and he's being chased by Padme and Obi-Wan and Anakin in their thing, and they are getting shot at by a couple of Count Dooku's friends, and they do this little swervy thing, and they hit this sand dune, and when they do, poor Padme and one clone trooper, they just fall right out that open door. Actually, it's not even an open door. There is no, there is no door there. The door there is totally yin. It was never there. It's so yin. It's just this big, giant gaping hole in the side of the ship. And so she falls out, and she's laying there on the sand, and Anakin, now remember, at this point, uh, 
uh, this is the love of his life, right? She's not pregnant yet. That's the next movie. Uh, but this is, he loves this woman. He is, he is super duper attached. And Obi-Wan may know about that, but we don't know for sure. If he does, he keeps it quiet. At the end of episode three, it's really clear that he knows about it. At this point, eh, I'm not really sure. We could say he does or he doesn't. I don't know. That might color the next bit. So I'll read this to you because the print might be a little small. So, so there's this, again, I'm not going to act the voices, sorry. Um, uh, but there's this heated exchange because Anakin is really ticked. The next thing they need to do right now is land this ship and go get Padme. That's his mission, right? That's his personal mission. Actually, it's also the mission that another Jedi has given him. He said to Anakin, at all costs, you have to protect the senator. For some reason, Anakin doesn't mention that in this little exchange, but that's okay. So Anakin says, put the ship down. Obi-Wan says, don't let your personal feelings get in the way. Follow that speeder. He's saying that to the pilot. Mm -hmm. Anakin says, lower the ship. Obi-Wan, I can't take Dooku alone. I need you. If we catch him, we can end this war right now. We have a job to do. Anakin says, I don't care. Put the ship down. Obi-Wan says, you will be expelled from the Jedi Order. Anakin says, I can't leave her. Obi-Wan says, come to your senses. What do you think Padme would do were she in your position? With really good grammar there, by the way. Um, so Anakin then comes around. He says, oh, she would continue the mission, right? Because that's the kind of woman Padme is. She is badass, and she would let me rot there in the sand, continue the mission. That's what we need to do. Now, it's, it's interesting that uh, Obi-Wan asks that question, what would Padme do, right? Because he knows that that's the thing that's going to turn Anakin around, that that's the only thing that Anakin really cares about is what would Padme want me to do? So he says, what would Padme do? I'm asking a different question. I'm asking, what would Yoda do? Now, we should all know the answer to that question because Yoda is the best of all the Jedi, right? Uh, he is the master of the Jedi Council. He is the grand best Jedi of them all, the wisest of the wise. So we know what Yoda would do. He would continue the mission because to divert from the mission for the sake of attachment would get somebody expelled from the Jedi Order. That's how bad it is to use attachment as an excuse for diverting from a mission. So what happens next? Uh, our boys here, Anakin and Obi-Wan, uh, trail Count Dooku to the place where Count Dooku's spaceship is stored. Uh, it's like this big giant garage in the mountain. And uh, they then attack Count Dooku. Anakin screws up. Uh, instead of having a coordinated attack, he insists on going in alone. He goes in there. Uh, Count Dooku immediately, like, force throws him up against the wall. Anakin falls down. He's knocked out. He's out of the fight. Um, later, he gets his arm cut off uh, in that same fight because arms. And then, and then uh, uh, Obi-Wan comes in. And Obi-Wan tries to fight Count Dooku, but also he is overmatched and he also is knocked unconscious. And so the two of them are lying in a heap on the floor of Count Dooku's space garage on the mountain in Geonosis. And then Yoda comes up, right? And so Yoda bursts in and he and Count Dooku exchange some words and Yoda reveals that Count Dooku was once his Padawan, once his student long ago. They have a really cool lightsaber fight with Yoda bouncing around the room and it's really nifty and it's, it is a cool lightsaber fight if you like little green guys bouncing around with glowing sticks. It's pretty cool. Uh, and uh, they're pretty evenly matched. They throw some force lightning bolts, or Count Dooku throws some force lightning bolts. Yoda catches them, which is a yin thing to do. And then he throws them back at Count Dooku, which is a yang thing to do. And uh, eventually, they seem pretty evenly matched. Count Dooku does a dirty trick. There are some cranes in the room, and Count Dooku uses the force to pull one of the cranes down. That's this shot right here. And this, this shot, by the way, lasts for all of about two seconds in the movie. It, is, it goes by super fast, but it really beautifully captures the point I'm trying to make. Yoda has to make a decision here, right? The crane is now falling, and there are, in that little, that little heap over there, that's Obi-Wan and Anakin uh, lying together. And then on this side, that is Count Dooku trying to get into his spaceship and make his escape. And so Yoda has to make a decision, right? So what would Yoda do? And everybody knows what Yoda does here, right? Yoda saves his friends. In spite of the fact that, though he wasn't there for it, 
uh, Obi-Wan is just given this big lecture, right? Uh, don't let your personal feelings get in the way. If we catch him, we can end this war right now. You will be expelled from the Jedi Order. And Yoda lets his attachment, his friendship for Obi-Wan and Anakin override this thing. Yoda knows totally what this means. This means episode three is going to be horrible. Um, he doesn't know about Order 66, but he knows there's a huge war coming up. Tons of these clone guys are going to die. Uh, it's going to be nasty. It's going to be ugly. There's going to be a war throughout the galaxy because Yoda makes this one decision. He values his friendship over the rational choice of catching this horrible, horrible, horrible man, right? So he lets him go. And Yoda, by the way, never gets expelled from the Jedi Order. Conveniently, the only witness to this is Count Dooku, uh, who Anakin later beheads. So uh, Yoda kind of gets away with it, right? Uh, and he gets to have his attachment thing, and nobody, nobody gets mad at him about it. So attachment issues. Um, I'm suggesting that that Anakin has some legit attachment issues. So he is living a happy life as a slave on the planet Tatooine, and this guy, Qui-Gon Jinn, comes by and uh, basically yanks him away from his mother, right? Uh, Shmi Skywalker is also a slave, and, uh, you know, Anakin is happy. I mean, if you look at that movie, that first movie, watch it, uh, the little guy who plays uh, Anakin, Jake, whose last name I can't remember suddenly, but that's okay. Anyway, uh, it's just a beautiful little performance. I mean, he's a sweet little kid. You just want to pinch his cheeks. I mean, he's really just adorable, and it's it's disgusting that he's going to become the greatest villain ever, right? Because he's just this this sweet, charming little child. And so they yank him away from his mom, who they leave there in captivity. And nobody ever goes back to get her, ever. Um, so it's not until another movie, the next, the second movie, um, when Anakin goes back and tries, you know, actually, you know, it's actually, the, this is, this, yeah, it's the second movie. I can't remember, they all blur together. Anakin goes back to rescue her because he's had visions that she's having some kind of problem. He ends up getting there just in the nick of time to have her die in his arms. But nobody, <laughs> nobody ever rescued her from slavery. Uh, that's a terrible idea, right? Because Obi-Wan is cruising around every day with this guy, Anakin, and like never says, hey, by the way, that sucks about your mom being a slave. Why don't we go to Tatooine and just take care of this? When they're there the first time, uh, the Jedi are for some reason strapped for cash. So in Tatooine, they don't, they don't take their crazy Republic credits. So the, they're cash poor and they can't, they can't rescue Shmi, they can't buy Shmi from her owner. But once they get back to Coruscant, like the Jedi temple is gigantic. They got tons of cool stuff they could sell or trade for her. They could like, and it would take like five minutes. Pew. Just fly out there, grab her, bring her back, right? Think of how psychologically awesome that would be for Anakin. So here's the, here's the point though, the point I'm making is the only reason they don't is they don't want to because you're not supposed to have attachments, right? Their deal is they want to take these kids from their parents at a very early age before the kids are really like into their parents, apparently. I mean, like, I guess a really early age. So if they were to bring Shmi to Coruscant, then this would be a distraction for Anakin. He would have an attachment and he wouldn't be a good Jedi. They're intentionally messing with this poor child, right? And Yoda is already into this. Like he knows this is going to be a bad idea. He's way too old. We should have yanked him from his mom a long time ago. You don't yank a seven-year-old from his mom. I guess you do that to like a three-year-old or something. And that's perfectly acceptable. But a seven-year-old, you just totally can't do that. And so Yoda knows we're going to totally mess with this guy's head for his entire life. And so they proceed to do that thing, right? And the business that happens, I think, to us as audience members is we know episodes four, five, and six. And from the, the what we know of Jedi is... Obi-Wan and Yoda, and they are cool, right? They are the best. They are awesome. And they are contrasted with Darth Vader, who is filth and horrible. And oh my God, Jedis are awesome. And so when we watch these Jedi do this horrible, horrible thing in episode one, we're not revulsed by it. We don't really think about it. Beautifully, in episode seven, we do get this bit, right? Where uh, General Leia Organa says to Han Solo about their son Ben Solo, who has become, as everybody knows, if you haven't watched it, oh my God, watch this movie. Um, 
Ben Solo becomes Kylo Ren, and he's carrying around that crazy red lightsaber with the special lightsaber hilt thing, and he's he's horrible and awesome. Um, but she says, I wanted him to train with Luke. I just never should have sent him away. That's when I lost him, right? And you're supposed to think, oh my gosh, that's exactly what Shmi did. And that didn't turn out very well, right? Um, uh, Shmi should have never let him go off with those Jedi guys. That's not going to work. By the way, the, thanks, Doug, for the Weird Al Yankovic thing that had put the phrase Jedi guy in my head. Thanks. So there you go. That came out. Um, so, I mean, I'm saying it's in the movie, right? Uh, that is, in episode two, we see uh, Obi-Wan tell Anakin, you don't do things because of attachment. That's a failure of the Jedi way. And we're like, yeah, you don't do things for attachment, Anakin, you idiot. And then Yoda goes right around behind him and totally does something for the sake of attachment. And we don't think twice about it as audience members. We're not like, wow, that must be a commentary in that earlier scene showing us that that uh, Obi-Wan's a complete idiot and thus everything in the Jedi order is wrong. We just kind of let that go. We just let it slide. And here, like, we don't go, wow, man, that was right. Yeah, you're the, made the same stupid move that Shmi made. Oh, this is horrible. Like, we don't really think about it in those terms because we don't criticize the Jedi. So life out of balance, right? Um, Kylo Ren is living a life out of balance in episode seven. That's part of his business. He is worried just as, uh, as Yoda was worried about Luke, that Luke would be seduced by the dark side. Uh, Kylo Ren is worried that he's going to be seduced by the light side. And so his mission in that movie is to destroy everything light inside himself, right? He has a chance at balance, and he's going to obliterate that balance. He wants to get rid of the light entirely. So he says this, this is kind of a prayer, I guess, to his grandfather, Darth Vader, and he's got Vader's helmet there. But he says, forgive me, I feel it again, the pull to the light. Supreme Leader senses it. Show me again the power of the darkness and I will let nothing stand in our way. Show me, Grandfather, and I will finish what you started. And right? so he's asking, help me get rid of this light thing. There's the later scene. In case anybody hasn't seen it, I won't spoil it, but you know, you all know the later scene that I'm not spoiling, right? Where he asks somebody for help, right? To do the, I need to do this thing, and I need you to help me. And that person says, oh, I'll totally help you. Um, and it turns out the help is help me obliterate the light, right? Kylo Ren is striving for a life out of balance because he believes that fully devoting himself to the dark side is the way to go, right? Um, and that's also like that version of what the Jedi believe, that is fully devoting oneself to the light side is the way to go. Maybe that's not a person's natural existence. Here's another thing. This is from a book from a couple of years ago. Um, which I haven't actually read, but that's okay. I'm an English professor. I don't have to read all the books. Uh, this is from a book called Aftermath, Empire's End. This is, uh, there was a series of books by this guy, Chuck Wendig, who's really uh, a cool writer. I will read this book one of these days. Uh, and so this is exploring that period between um, uh, Return of the Jedi and, what was it, uh, Force Awakens, right? And so between episode six and seven, he wrote this series of books. And in this, in, in the part of this book, uh, Princess Leia is pregnant with soon to be Ben Solo. And she has this weird kind of reverie moment where she's thinking about the unborn child inside her and she is force sensitive. And so she understands the force in some ways. Again, way too tiny for you to read. So I'll read it out loud to you. Uh, he is less a human shaped thing and more of a pulsing living band of light. Light that sometimes dims, um, that sometimes is thrust through with a vein of darkness. That's how she describes the force of her unborn child. Light that also has this vein of darkness in it. Right now, her son is upset, tumbling inside her as if he can't get comfortable, his light flickering with the dark. She centers herself and concentrates. The walls of the room fall away. Everything is white, and then it's black. Then she's in the calm, uh, airless void. As Leia finds her peace, so does her son. He stops turning. So she meditates a little bit about the Force, right, and gets herself to a good place. Now, there are two totally different ways you can read this bit, uh, and I'm insisting on one of them because it fits my version of this, so there you go. Uh, that is, uh, I think that little, little infant zygote 
uh, Ben Solo here has a healthy existence. He has light and he is shot through with a bit of darkness. That is, a Taoist would be like, oh, okay, that's cool. Yeah, you've got a little bit of the yin, you've got a little bit of the yin. Good for you, baby. Rock and roll, right? Um, Leia is contemplating that, right? Like, oh, he's got this darkness in him. And there's there's a little bit I cut out there. It goes on and on about how uh, Luke says, so yeah, you know, everybody's got some darkness in them, and sometimes the darkest shadows uh, come from the brightest light in this kind of business. Uh, but she's got this anxiety. As soon as she starts thinking about this little vein of darkness in her baby's light, she gets all this anxiety because she's on the Jedi side, right? She's all about embrace the light side and reject the dark side. And so she gets all this anxiety and then her baby gets anxious about this. And she does this force meditation. And it's interesting what, what the author does here. And again, I'm an English professor, so this is the kind of stuff I grab onto, right? When she meditates, her, if her meditation is all about the light side, then she should have all light, right? But that's followed by, and then the blackness, right? That is her meditation that helps calm her and her baby is both yin and yang. It is not one or the other, right? So she has both elements in her meditation. So I'm suggesting that it's possible that the good folks at Disney and Kathleen Kennedy and all of our wonderful people who are keeping this story alive for us um, maybe get all this stuff, and maybe this is going to be a thing. I'm really suggesting that I think it was supposed to be a thing in episodes one, two, and three, but generally we as an audience just kind of missed it. So what I'm suggesting is if you go back and watch one, two, and three again, and you should, this time, it really, it's worth it. Um, this time, watch it with the idea in your head that the Jedi are idiots. Like everything a Jedi says is wrong right from the start. Maybe Qui-Gon Jinn is the only guy who understands what's going on. Um, and he gets killed immediately. So, oh, sorry, another spoiler. Um, so so Qui-Gon Qui may be a guy who has a sense of it. But again, he doesn't go back. Well, I guess he couldn't. Oh, okay, I was going to accuse him of not going back and rescuing Shmi Skywalker, but he's dead. So, okay, he probably would have. That's my story. He would have gone back to rescue Shmi and not been a jerk about that. Right? So, yeah. The prophecy makes no sense, but it makes sense, right? Um, in this sense, the chosen one does his thing, right? He destroys the Jedi because the Jedi are a mess. The Jedi, val uh, the Jedi do not value the Tao. They do not understand balance at all. And so he has to destroy the out-of-balance Jedi as step one to bringing balance to the Force. And then, it's a long time later, which well, he'd done a little faster, but okay, a long time later, he destroys the other half of the equation, the Sith, who are also out of balance. And thus, by destroying the two out of balance forces, the Force itself achieves balance, right? So if you think of, if you think of the Force as being Taoist, and you understand that the Jedi don't get it, suddenly the prophecy does make sense, right? And this, this is the thing, as I was telling my students about this thing about how, you know, these Taoists don't get it because for the Taoists, you know, the Jedi really are a mess and the Jedi really need to be destroyed in order to achieve balance. And, oh my God, Anakin really destroys the Jedi. Oh, this is so cool. And so I was like in the middle of this lecture and I first figured this out like an idiot. So there you go. Thank you. Good evening. If there are any questions, I'll be happy to answer some. Any questions? Oh, oh, so lucky me the mic died. Sorry. Uh, okay. So I have, uh, I have, damn. You want to use my helmet? Yeah, that would be great, actually. That would be really hot, but great. Okay, so I will say, so just as a caveat, so those of you who know me, uh, don't, please don't turn this into a Star Wars trivia thing. I can't do that. So I, one of my, one of the reasons I came to thinking way too much, way more than a normal person thinks about Star Wars, was because I used to freelance for Wizards of the Coast, the people who make Dungeons and Dragons, and I edited uh, role-playing game books for them. And uh, basically, I was it was my job to make sure that everything made sense in the Star Wars universe, all the Star Wars stuff did. For instance, one time there was an adventure where some people were supposed to be stranded with these cheesy starships, and they would strand them out in the middle of nowhere. 
But in fact, um, they weren't stranded because I knew that those starships actually had hyperdrive. So I had to make that note to somebody. But now here's the deal. Here's what I'm telling you. I don't know all that like as depth knowledge. I just know where to look for all that stuff, right? So, uh, so yeah, I'll totally lose at any kind of Star Wars trivia thing unless I have like my giant set of encyclopedias and my Wikipedia on the computer, and then I'm set, and then I'll kick anybody's butt. Um, but without that stuff, no, no trivia. But anyway, so thanks. Any questions for about anything? Any challenges? Yeah, what do you got? Yeah. And so I think what Lucas or whoever it was did was they had some vague concept of history and thought, but didn't know specifics. And so I think that probably, you know, they borrowed here and there without having a real concept of the whole, the whole thing. And also, it's interesting, though, that if you look at um, that supposedly Dallas monks, um, although they're supposed to be very men, people train for bodies. Yeah. You know, so there is that dichotomy there with them. So it's very interesting, though. I think that's very fascinating. Yeah, and you're, you're totally right about the Buddhist thing, which I was going to try to address, but then I decided not to, right? Um, uh, but so, yeah, so the Jedi are good Buddhists. That is, uh, um, the passivity, uh, they understand as a, uh, as a way woo, how does, I can't remember what it, Doug, you were talking to me about some of Wu Wei, thank you. Yeah, so they, but they understand that, that sometimes like um, the way we see Qui-Gon uh, meditate before that last battle, with uh, Darth Maul, um, that's totally a Buddhist move to make, right? Get get passive and get clear before you have this big fight. Um, so they're good Buddhists. They're just terrible, terrible Taoists. Yeah. Um, which so yeah. So I totally ignored the fact that they are good Buddhists for the sake of brevity. But yes, that is really a thing. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions or comments? Yes. Well, I hadn't really thought about yin and yang. At all. I thought it was all about explosions and lightsabers. <laughs> yes. But I have, I have a question. Uh, George Lucas acknowledged that uh, Joseph Campbell's work, myth, you know, the myth stories, the hero of a thousand faces, played a role in developing Star Wars. Yes. But uh, those heroes that Campbell based his book on, his work on, they're all men. Yeah. Women played almost no role at all. And he, in fact, said, Campbell said that that was because they were too busy taking care of the kids and keeping the house. Yeah, Campbell was horrible, by the way. Yeah. Adventures. yeah. Lucas, on the other hand, brought women in as a sort of central part of his movies. Yeah, no, I mean, we can't pretend like there's the same number of women, right? But we have, but Star Wars does bring us some, some great female characters, and especially in the 70s and a time when there weren't, right? Princess Leia um, was awesome, uh, is awesome. Well, that, yeah. She would sell movies. Yeah, yeah. And, and not, and not for, not as eye candy, right? But as, <laughs> as just sheer badassery, right? The, Oh, my mic's tiny. The princess who rescues herself effectively, right? Uh, because there's that great scene in the Death Star where they, the Han and Luke are just bumbling around, and then she's the one who thinks of, if I shoot that grate out there, then we can get out of here somewhere, right? So she grabs the blaster from their hand. So yeah, yeah, Lucas is not, uh, I mean, he was a little probably too wedded to Campbell. I mean, like, you can kind of go step by step, and Stephen has a great lecture about this, by the way. Uh, uh, so, uh, yeah, maybe maybe next year's October um, Science Cafe, right? Uh, so, yeah, this is, that is a good point. Any other questions or comments? Yes? Um, you mentioned early on that uh, how black and white and the end of the game didn't match, and that, you know, yeah. it was kind of backwards. Yeah. Uh, but Lucas grew up watching Cowboy movies. Every Saturday to watch Cowboy movies, so it makes perfect sense. You know? Right, yeah, the good guys were, well, because... Cowboy movies are Manichaean also, right? Yeah, I mean, that's that's completely the thing, yeah. So so Lucas can't, and in, in fact, I mean, I was I was probably not leaning as heavily on, I'm joking about this when I said it, because, because if Lucas had done it the other way around, right, if the Jedi had been all about the dark side, right, and we must battle the terrible light side Sith, 
audiences would have been like, this is the stupidest thing, or at least Western audiences would have just gone away, right? I mean, it just doesn't make sense from the outset. So he doesn't have a choice. I mean, there's really nothing nothing he can do about it at all. He's got to stick with that, to that mode, right? Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all very much. I really appreciate you coming out. I seriously do. I was, I was worried no one would care. Thank you. Thank you.